So yeah, Neb, um, welcome. Um, I, you you are our re res resident guest, um, uh, Death of Empire obituarist. Um, <laughs> perhaps you can tell me what what do you think is the significance of Biden being pressured out of the presidency, and uh, what's in store for the Democratic Party and the election in November? Marla well, my, well, well, my question when I when I uh, heard the news was what took them so long. I mean, Biden was supposed to bow out for Harris originally. He was he he, he sold his they sold his candidacy back in 2020 as a sort of a transition candidate and not like a transitioning, you know, in their in their sense, preferred sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was supposed to be there to pave the way for Harris to sort of take over, and his job was to you know be the figurehead that would let the Democrats get rid of Trump. And then he stayed in the presidency for some reason. Um, I, it could have something to do with Hunter Biden's laptop and the need to you know, protect Hunter from prosecution. Uh, it could have something to do with you know, his vanity or his wife's vanity or you know, a number of reasons. Uh, we just don't know because obviously the White House hasn't been transparent and the media was too busy carrying water for them to ask questions as they were supposed to. And so, you know, finally, he, he basically gets airlifted out of Vegas, sent to Delaware, ostensibly with COVID. We don't know. I mean, according to White House doctor, he's doing great. He's, you know, taken like, I think, eight doses of Paxlovid, which if most people has actually caused COVID to get worse. But whatever. Um, and there's rampant speculation that he's not, in fact, alive. Mm. To which I would, you know, in the immortal words of Hillary, Hillary Clinton, what difference at this point does it make? <laughs> because <laughs> the deep state has functioned all these years with a figurehead token president anyway. So rotating him out, you know, swapping him out to Harris doesn't really doesn't really change anything. And now there's this whole sickening, you know, uh, tributes to the wonderful man Joe Biden has always been. And I'm like, have you met the guy? <laughs> because I distinctly remember this Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee hearing from like back in 99 where Richard Holbrook was being tapped for UN ambassador and it was Biden and Jesse Helms well mostly Biden really because Helms was basically in the place Biden is now the uncompost mentis mm. um, buttering each other up and essentially just you know being all obsequious and, and um, congratulatory. And there was not a single adversarial question during the entire hearing. It was just kind of saccharine and sickening at the same time. Um, but, you know, he was never a nice person. There's a whole body of, of record on his behavior in Congress that, you know, he, he was never a nice man. So, I don't know, like, th this whole thing is so fake and so performative. And so just, I mean, the same people who three days ago were crucifying Biden for, you know, staying in power for too long, but had 10 days ago or 15 days ago, right before that disastrous debate, were saying, no, no, everything's fine. He's sharp as ever. He's, he's running circles around everybody. Like, well, which is it? When were you lying? Then or now or tomorrow? It's, it, you can't trust any of this. It's all fake. And so what difference does it make, you know, whether whether the titular emperor of the American globalist American empire is is, you know, an octogenarian guy from Delaware who's got the imagination of Walter Mitty or, uh, you know, a very identity confused um, half Caribbean, half Indian, grown up in Canada, married to a Jewish guy lady who nobody ever voted for, not even within the party, and is mm. somehow going to win 100 billion votes at 3 a.m. on November 6th. That's a joke. Please don't <laughs> delete me. Um, um, you know, what difference does it make? No. Well, I mean, it, just, it, stri it strikes me, actually, that, yes, the... the um... Well, I think Alex and I will get into this later in the show, but um, Kamala, it just strikes me as another ideal puppet. It's like Biden, but without the very obvious dementia. Like someone who, there, there was a, a, a fascinating, I think it was New York Times, it might be Washington Post, they're basically the same uh, at this mm -hmm. stage, that, that it reported on how the CIA and the military greatly enjoyed having Biden 
um, as president, of course, they didn't use such flagrant language uh, because it meant that they uh, they could just just get on with their work without being hassled and without having to keep key people in the loop. Um, uh, it strikes me that, like, yes, that I mean, Harris is like very would very much fulfill that fulfill that role as well. Um, and well, probably, yeah. while also while also acting as a proxy for uh, her for her dear friend Hillary Clinton, who might run as vice president, reportedly. That Harris Clinton ticket would be the some year of five emperors stuff yes. right there. And of yes. course, if that actually happens, Harris would have to basically spend every waking moment of her life looking over her shoulder. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would, if they appeared in public, it would you know, raise the very obvious question of, of who's guarding Hades um, at this particular, <laughs> particular point. But, um, but yeah, um, I think that... Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I asked Alex to uh, include this um, in our show agenda because I figured we would get on to it. Um, this is an article that you noticed in Time magazine at the start of mm -hmm. 2020, I believe it was the start of 2021, um, which you, uh, uh, your analysis, and I don't disagree, um, it was that this effectively laid out how there was a colour revolution of the, of the type practised in Eastern and Central Europe following the fall of the Soviet Union um, in America. Uh, so, um, can you talk us through it? Sure. Um, so this, this is the inf yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So this is the infamous fortification piece. Basically, it was written by Molly Ball, who is the biographer of Nancy Pelosi, uh, who, just by the virtue of that fact, is basically um, a inner party cadre. Mm. Uh, but there is a revelation she makes in the piece that she's been in text communication with the basically point man for this entire operation who she names and i'm not going to mm. try to pronounce his name because i'm going to mangle it uh and this is the you know secret history of a shadowy cabal that conspired to save democracy by fortifying the election against trump back in 2020 and i recommend everybody you know either go to time site or or check out the archive link and just read through this with an open mind and be cognizant of like all of the rhetorical tricks that are used, you know, loaded language and all. But it's basically laying out how the Democrats, with the assistance of some of the anti-Trump Republicans and basically the deep state, essentially created the conditions for the 2020 election to have the correct outcome, as one person said, which would be Joe Biden. Yeah. And it's one of those... There's been several books written about how the election was rigged, and one of them is called rigged, and they focused on Zuckerbucks and all these activists processing mail-in ballots and all that stuff. This is the sort of a... Remember how O.J. Simpson had a book called If I Did It? <laughs> that was essentially yes. a confession of how he offed uh, his wife and, and her lover? This is it. Mm. That's basically... This is the political equivalent of... So it, it, it's it's... Th these guys wanted you to know what they did so they could mm. take credit for it. And the thing that really got me the most was, and this is the, the moment I zoomed on, I don't think anybody else has. It's uh, January 6, 2021. Mm. Biden is the designated president-elect thanks to batches of votes processed in the dead of night, at, you know, several key jurisdictions. Uh, whose authority is literally said ahead of time, Biden's going to win this election and here's how. And, you know, Trump is calling for a massive protest in D.C. He's got, you know, tens of thousands of people coming in. But hmm. already after the, the election results were announced and everybody rushed to congratulate Biden, all of a sudden people around D.C. started boarding up their stores. And Everybody was like, wait a second, but Trump's people aren't the rioters. The rioters were like Black Lives Matter of the, of the month, you know, the summer past. And you didn't board up your source then. What, what gives? And Ball goes to uh, describe in the, in the text, and again, everybody should read it. Though, no, I'm going to paraphrase it crudely. But she basically texts the person that she names as the head of this conspiracy and says, you know, where are our guys? And he says, we told them to stand down because we didn't want any blame for the mayhem. Wait a minute. This is the morning of January 6th. Trump was impeached by Congress. 
for allegedly telling these people to storm the Capitol at like noon and that the riot itself didn't start until like 1.30. So how did they know there was going to be mayhem? Mm. Oh, and then you realize that the key feature of every color revolution is that you have these trained agitators working for the color revolution sponsor, hijacking an actual popular protest. This is the key. Every time you have a color revolution, whether it's Georgia or Ukraine or Belarus or whatever, every time you have a color revolution, you have some kind of popular protest, mass event. Uh, mm. where people take to the streets, whether genuinely or they have, gre- whatever. They might have genuine grievances. This was pioneered here in Serbia, actually, you know, 24 years ago now. Mm. I will be a very grim anniversary come October. Um, and it basically, you have people inspired by something, that, that, that something might be a manufactured pretext, but they have genuine grievances, and they show up, and then their energy is hijacked by these agitators who direct them to the desired outcome. Now, in case of Serbia, they brought in a, a, a bit of construction machinery and barged into the state television and attacked the parliament. And that was the signal to sort of, you know, sack the parliament, burn the ballot boxes so they, they could never be proven who actually won the presidential election. Hmm, sounds familiar. And then declare victory because the police and the military who have already been infiltrated in Serbia's case with like CIA uh, cadres would defect. And the president, Slobodan Milosevic in this case, would be, essentially be left alone and told, if you don't resign, this will be civil war. And in Milosevic's case, uh, the nominal leader of the Serbian opposition, which was united by the American embassy, literally, and they didn't hide it, uh, went over to the presidential presidency and said, look, we have a deal, you know, you, you give up, we take over, we don't prosecute you. Mm. And then within, you know, six months, they broke that. But so obviously I'm primed to see parallels here, but they're kind of so obvious you can't miss mm. them. And then you, after Jan, you know, after January 6th serves as a pre, and the funny thing is, the January 6th riot, the, the, uh, the, the rioters broke into the Capitol at the very moment that the Republicans were actually filing official objections to the, to the certification of the results. And this is a constitutional process. This happened many, many, many times. Yes. Um, you know, Democrats have objected to countless elections over the past 25 years. Um, but the moment these Republican senators and members of Congress were starting to object, this is when the breach of Capitol happens. And then the mayhem ensues, and the initial reports and the narrative that is pushed immediately of an insurrection, which is a loaded word from the U.S. Constitution, from the amendment adopted right after the Civil War, gets pushed into the public. And all of a sudden, all of these Republicans immediately fold, because let's face it, they, they're trained to be controlled by certain words, and they essentially drop all of their objections and the, there's a rush to certify the election for Biden without any sort of consideration, debate, or, or examining what actually happened. Hmm. Which, you know, to me, adds up to a color revolution. <clears throat> and, of course, then, you know, they bring out the National Guard, a security inauguration against completely phantom imaginary threats that never materialized. Washington, D.C. turned into an armed camp. They're, the optics of this are horrific. And then Nancy Pelosi gets to parade around like a victorious military general. And I wrote a follow-up. Now, I wrote a piece about this on January 14th. This is like three weeks before this piece, this, this Time Magazine article yeah. came out. And I'm like, there was a civil war. We just didn't notice because most of it wasn't kinetic. Mm. And then these guys dropped the article. And on that particular day, I'm shrieking, oh, my dear God, how did I not see this? And also, damn it, I was right. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it was one of those... I just realized I was vindicated and it sucked. Yes. So, you know. Alex and I were talking about that, uh, that, that earlier. Yeah, there, there are those moments where you're proven right. And uh, God, God, it's terrible. It's like the worst depressed, feeling ever. Depressing and frustrating and, and, and all sorts of stuff. I mean, I think that there's another, there is an aspect of the article that you that you noticed, which um, I think that is a, is a really good note to go out on because of its wider, I think, um, application to the US empire at this time. Um, references to Roadrunner. Yes, yes. So the, the uh, ironically, one of the so-called Republicans uh, involved in this plot 
basically said, you know, our democracy is like Wiley Coyote. You know, he's going to he's going to start falling the moment he notices that he's over the cliff. But he's like he's run off the cliff. But you know how in, in the cartoon, the coyote chases the roadrunner yeah. and he chases the roadrunner off a, of a mesa or something. And the roadrunner just keeps going because roadrunner is the protagonist and has plot armor and is impervious to laws of gravity. Whereas the coyote keeps going and then realizes, oh, my God, I'm, you know, treading air and then he drops to his death. Right. And so this. This guy unironically makes the comment that democracy works so long as we don't look down. And you realize that this whole notion of our democracy at home and the globalist American empire abroad is essentially based on a lie. It's based on <laughs> massive amount of self-deception. <laughs> right. It's basically based on self-deception. We claim to be the rulers of the world. And so long as we don't look down and ascertain that we're actually hovering in, in, in the air, this works. But it doesn't. Because, you know, when you had Afghans serving the empire try to tread air in, in August of you know, 2021, they fell off the wheels. It didn't work. And, you know, this, I mean, all we've seen for the past three years is the American empire crashing and burning because they can no longer tell fact from fiction and i think this the, the fact that they managed to pull this off because it's such a bold plan it's it's such a audacious crime against reality they persuaded themselves that they can control reality and shape it to their desires and they've been acting on it ever since and reality has unlike american elections has failed to conform to their expectations and so here we are, almost four years later, they're probably preparing to fortify another election. I wouldn't put it past them. I really wouldn't. Um, and, you know, this whole drama about installing and anointing Kamala Harris as the, as, 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 you know, the Democrats chosen without any primaries. This is literally a woman who dropped out before the first primary in 2020 and was brought in as a favor to James Clyburn, who basically told Biden, I can deliver black Americans. Now, whether all of these people actually voted because Clyburn told them so, or their votes were counted for Biden for other reasons, I'm not getting into that. But he, Clyburn basically said, I can get the black vote for you. And as in, ret in return, you have to give me a black Supreme Court, female black Supreme Court justice, check, and you have to give me a black female vice president. And out of this entire lineup, Kamala Harris was the only candidate that, that fit that criteria. She was literally picked for her pigmentation and her identity politics. Nothing else. Not electability, not record, not anything. And they admitted it. it was, the Washington Post had an article. I mean, the Post is such an organ of the party that you, you can't really tell where the Democratic Party begins and the Washington Post ends. And yeah, they were openly talking about this deal with Clyburn. So... It's one of those, they're not hiding it, they're not highlighting it, but they're not, got, they're not going out of their way to, you know, belabor the point. But they've definitely revealed it, it's on the record. And so the fact that they're going through this rigmarole now suggests that they're really trying to secure this, you know, the, the, the favorable election result come November, one way or another. And that sort of gives me pause because, again, we've established that these people are seriously deluded about how reality works because they've managed kind of like the American success in Gulf War One, which was in many respects a perfect storm, pun intended, of like how the military and planning and logistics and political circumstances and everything else lined up has led them to believe that their military is this unstoppable, you know, fifth generation warfare colossus and then the world will basically bow at their feet and it is being very very conclusively demonstrated in the battlefields of ukraine that this is not the case but there seems to be like an accountability gap between perception and reality that doesn't reach the pentagon just like this you know failures of empire don't reach the political class in washington i lived in the city for 25 years i know that they're delusional but they just seem to believe that there's no consequences for their actions and they can just generate some magic words and will the reality away. Like, like Wiley Coyote. <laughs> like cheap uh, fakes. 
Yeah, yeah, like cheap, cheap face. Face. yeah. Well, no, on that bombshell, Neb, um, thank you very much for um, coming on our show. We hope to see you again. Where can people find you? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at Neboisha Malich, and I'm also on Telegram at The, Nebula the Nebulator. Um, yeah, <laughs> those are my two primary uh, means of, of uh, shit posting, sh shall we say, uh, where I offer hot takes on uh, the American Empire and uh, other things. Yeah. I bet Nebulator seemed like a really cool name when you came up with it, didn't it? Um. Um, <laughs> it was suggested by a friend. It was a nice little, you know, pun on my name and piercing through the fog of lies. Flies over a lot of people's heads, but it, it's kind of neat. And plus, I took the cover photo myself, so I'm kind of proud of that. Oh, excellent. All right, then. N N N well, no, thank you so much for coming on. See you again. Take care. Thank Good you. Luck. Hey everyone, um, if you enjoyed this video or, or any of our other content, uh, please give us a follow on Twitter or subscribe to us on YouTube. It will help us beat the algorithm oligarchs. Thank you.